red dwarf and the seven planets. In February 22, 2017, not that long ago, there was a release uh, from NASA entitled NASA Telescope Reveals Largest Batch of Earth Size Habitable Zone Planets Around a Single Star. And uh, there's a couple of buzzwords in there. Earth Size Habitable Zone. What are they looking for? They're looking for planets on which life could have arisen or will arise. And you can get this on the internet and look it up and uh, see what I've skipped and whether I've skipped anything really important. Um, the, uh, the piece begins, uh, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope has revealed the first known system of seven Earth-sized planets around a single star. Three of these planets are firmly located in the habitable zone, the area around the planet star where a rocky planet is most likely to have liquid water. We're going to come into the definition of that in just a little bit. The discovery sets a new record for the greatest number of habitable zone planets found around a single star outside of our solar system. All of these seven planets could have liquid water, key to life as we know it, under the right atmospheric conditions. But the chances are highest with the three in the habitable zone. How do you get all seven of them possibly having liquid water? Well, we'll see in a minute. This is the picture that uh, it comes immediately after that text. And you can see a very nice little uh, ice and water covered uh, planet with uh, a uh, white sun in the background. Um, the discovery could be a significant piece in the puzzle of finding habitable environments, places that are conducive to life. Maybe we can colonize this thing. So Thomas uh, Zerbuchin, Associate Administrator of the Agency Science Mission Director in Washington. Answering the question, are we alone, is a top science priority, and finding so many planets like these for the first time in the habitable zone is a remarkable step forward towards that goal. The uh, mission of NASA is finding the, answering the question, are we alone? At about 40 light years, at 235 trillion miles from the Earth, the system of planets is relatively close to us in the constellation Aquarius. Because they're located outside our solar system, these planets are scientifically known as exoplanets. This exoplanet system is called TRAPPIST-1, named for the Transiting Planets and Planetismal Small Telescope, which they named so that it would make a nice uh, acronym there, in Chile. In May 2016, researchers used TRAPPIST and, uh, using TRAPPIST announced that they had discovered three planets in the system. Assisted by several ground-based telescopes, including the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope, Spitzer confirmed the existence of two of these planets and discovered five additional ones, increasing the number of known planets in the system to seven. Uh, skipping on a little bit further using Spitzer data, the team precisely measured the sizes of the seven planets and developed first estimates of the masses of six of them, allowing their density to be estimated. Why not the seventh? We'll find out in a minute. Well, a few minutes. Um, based on their densities, all the TRAPPIST-1 planets are likely to be rocky. They're too dense to be gaseous planets. Further observations will not only help determine whether they are rich in water, but also possibly reveal whether any could have liquid water on their surfaces. The mass of the seventh and furthest exoplanet has not yet been estimated. Scientists believe it could be an icy, snowball-like world, but further observations are needed. They have exactly one observation. The seven wonders of TRAPPIST-1 are the first Earth-sized planets that have been found orbiting this kind of star, said Michael Gillon, lead author of the paper and principal investigator of the TRAPPIST Exoplanet Survey at the University of Liege, Belgium. It is also the best target yet for studying the atmospheres of potentially habitable Earth-sized worlds. In contrast to our sun, the TRAPPIST-1 star, classified as an ultra-cool dwarf, is so cool that liquid water could survive on planets orbiting very close to it, closer than is possible on planets in our solar system. 
All seven of the TRAPPIST-1 planetary orbits are closer to their host star than Mercury is to our Sun. The planets are also very close to each other. If a person was standing on one of the planet's surface, they could gaze up and potentially see geological features or clouds of neighboring worlds, which would sometimes appear larger than the moon in Earth's sky. The planets may also be tidally locked to their star, which means that the same side of the planet is always facing the star. Therefore, each side is per either perpetually day or night. This could mean they have weather patterns totally unlike those on Earth, such as strong winds blowing from the day side to the night side, uh, probably in the upper range, whereas in the night side you kind of expect the winds to be cool and pushing into the day side, but whatever, and extreme temperature changes. Now, tidally locked is sort of what, like what the moon is towards the Earth. It always presents the same face. The back side of the moon you can't see unless you go outside the Earth. Uh, and so these things probably are locked in on their little sun. Uh, moving on, following up on the Spitzer discovery, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has initiated the screening of four of the planets, including the three inside the habitable zone. These observations aim at assessing the presence of puffy hydrogen-dominated atmospheres typical for gaseous worlds like Neptune, or kind of for that matter like Venus, uh, around these planets. In May 2016, the Hubble team observed the two innermost planets and found no evidence for such puppy atmospheres. This strengthened the case that the planets closest to the star are rocky in nature. Most of them are probably rocky because they're too dense to be just collections of uh, gas uh, like uh, Jupiter is supposed to be. Moving on, uh, the, uh, they have a picture of the system which gives the size of the dwarf star compared with uh, seven planets. Uh, D, E, and F, and maybe G are the ones that are the most interesting for uh, possibly having uh, water in them, E in particular. Um, a nice photo of uh, some very well drawn planets. You would have to ask if those are actual pictures. <laughs> well, in a little bit, we'll see what they expanded on to get that. Uh, so yes, take all of those drawings with a grain of salt. And uh, now, one of the things you should realize is that these planets are very close to their sun. Here you can see the TRAPPIST-1 system and the Mercury-Venus-Earth-Mars system, and we're in the middle of the habitable zone. Uh, but these are actually enlarged 25 times, so they, their orbits all fit nicely within Mercury's orbit, all seven of them. These are very close to their, to their sun in terms of astronomical units. Um, and here's another drawing that makes that perhaps even clearer. Here's what the, it would look like if those were fit into our solar system. And interestingly, the sun isn't that much bigger than Jupiter. Our sun, by contrast, is about that, the size of that ring there. And so um, this, is a, this has Earth-sized planets, as you can see, comparison with the size of Earth. These are a little smaller. There's a couple of them that are actually slightly bigger, according to the calculations they're making. Um, but, um, but they're orbiting uh, very much closer to the star than what we are. And really not that much different from Jupiter. That is, um, Callisto is actually probably further out than the, than the orbit of uh, Trappist B. Well, this got into the news all over the place, and I'm just gonna run through a few uh, 
A few comments. Scientists find three new planets where life could have evolved. You can see where this is going. Scientists have discovered at least three new planets in our galaxy that could have allowed life to evolve. The Earth-sized worlds lie in the Goldilocks zone of their sun where temperatures are not too hot, not too hot or cold, and are thought to be capable of having oceans of water. You need water for life. Moving a little bit on, Trappist-1 lies in Aquarius constellation and has just under a tenth of the mass of our sun. Notice it has much less than a tenth of the size. So it's kind of compacted more than our sun is. Um, moving on, just last week NASA announced it had discovered carbon-based organic material similar to what may have been the building blocks for life on Earth on Ceres, the dwarf planet located between Mars and Jupiter. Why well, Sky News is interested in the origin of life and whether life might be found elsewhere. Maybe it's on Ceres. Ceres has no atmosphere. It's much colder than Earth or even Mars. But they're carbon-based organic material. In November, the U.S. Space Agency's New Horizons spacecraft found evidence that Pluto may have a large ocean hidden under its frozen surface, a likely place for life to begin. The vast site containing as much water as all of Earth's seas could also be potentially a habitat for life. Wow. You can see where Sky News is going. Well, let's try the telegraph here. NASA discovers new solar system, TAPIS-1, where life may have evolved on three planets. Life may have evolved on at least three planets within a newly discovered solar system that is 39 light years from Earth. It was announced last night. You see what they're hearing, and with some justification, is maybe life evolved there. Um, the plants were detected using NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope and several ground-based observations. Lead researcher Michael Guillaume of the uh, University of Liege said the planets are all close to each other and very close to the star, which is very reminiscent of the moons around Jupiter. Still, the star is so small and cold that the seven planets are temperate, which means they could have some liquid water and maybe life by extension on the surface. Everybody is excited. And uh, to your question here, this is NASA discovers the TRAPPIST-1 star with seven Earth-sized planets in its orbit. In pictures. Would you like to see some of those pictures? Well, there's one of them. Amazing how they got that. It's even more amazing when you see the data they got it from. Um, here's another with all the planets lined up, and you can see that there are, you know, the smallest one is about 0.76 maybe, and that's an estimate. Uh, there's one that's 0.77 times the size of the Earth, and there's 1.09 times the size of the Earth, and even one that's 1.13 times the size of the Earth. F is the closest match to Earth. This is the one that's in the so-called habitable zone. Now, would the habitable zone be different? Well, yes, if you have a star that's not shining as brightly, it would be closer to the star. But the question is, if you have a tidally locked planet, does that make the habitable zone wider or actually narrower? Don't know. But here's another shot. You like that, don't you? Okay. Here's another picture of the star with the planets surrounding it. Um, they have some shots of people, and I'll just throw one so you can see somebody actually talking about it. But then they have a shot here. How's that? Here's another shot. Well, that, that one you can see is kind of imaginary. Um, here's an ad if you want to go to one of those planets. Is that enticing? Um, and then there is... Um, uh, another shot of a planet with the sun behind it. Um, 
there's uh, uh, some stats. And this is interesting because you, now you're going to find out that these things are so close they orbit rapidly. The inner one has a period of 1.51 days. That is, in one day, a little over, it actually completely goes around the, the diminutive sun. 2.4 days. The most is maybe 20 days, 12.35 days for, uh, for this one. Now, to be honest with you, that number is probably the most accurate of all those numbers. Everything else is kind of some inferences. But you can see that even, even our Mercury, going around a much heavier sun, go, uh, goes around in 87 days, um, 88 days. And um, here's this one that's 20, and that one that's 12.35. So these things are much closer to a less strongly gravitational sun. Um, and Mars takes almost two years. Uh, moving on, the six inner planets lie in a temperate zone where surface temperatures range from zero to 100 degrees centigrade. Now, I don't know about you, but that seem, doesn't seem terribly temperate, especially the upper range there. But see, if all that counts is you've got liquid water, then water is still liquid at 95 degrees centigrade, right? You wouldn't want to live there, but uh, moving on, about around a fifth of the sun-like stars are thought to have an Earth-sized planet in their habitable zones. Astronomers estimate there could be as many as 40 billion habitable works, uh, worlds in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Professor Zerbichin says that now was a gold rush phase in the search for these exoplanets. About a fifth of sun-like stars are thought to have an Earth-sized planet in their habitable zones. Many, many Earths that could be lived on. Um, yeah. Doesn't... Uh, That's, uh, what shall I say, it seems optimistic. Well, there's a reason for that optimism. Now, I want you to notice in both of the sky and the telegraph reports, mention of the fact that these things are tidally locked to their star so that the, always the same faces, side faces that sun and always the other side faces out into the cold is is omitted, and you know even for the moon that's a problem because at least but at least the moon uh, turns around relative to the sun every about uh, 29 days or so, 30 days, but um, in this case these things apparently don't uh, turn around at all. They're figuring which means that always the same side is toward the sun and always the same side is toward the other side. And so you might have ice on one side and you might have it hot enough to you know, melt lead on the other side. And when they're talking about a habitable zone, it will be a thin ring around the uh, equator, or pardon me, around the, what would you call it? The, the light-dark definition uh, and that's that's where you would uh, that's where you would have the only zone where water would be liquid. Now that means, of course, that the hot ones might have still a little liquid water right in the back, and the cold ones might have a little liquid water right in the in the front where the where the star is shining on it. And uh, of course, they have the familiar uh, Trappist one system. Um, Let's look at another one, the Independent, NASA's Holy Grail, solar system that could support alien life discovered. Again, everybody's excited about the alien life. It is amazing, quote, how similar the entire solar system is to Earth. Well, except for a few problems. Scientists have found a new solar system filled with planets that look like Earth and could support life, NASA has announced. 
At least three of the seven planets represent the holy grail for planet hunting astronomers. Between zero and 100. Because they sit within the temperate zone and are the right temperature to allow alien life to flourish, the researchers have said. Again, take that with a grain of salt. They're capable of having oceans, again, suggesting that life could flourish on them. Moving on, TRAPPIST-1 burns hydrogen so slowly that it will live for another 10 trillion years, more than 700 times longer than the universe has existed so far, which is arguably enough time for life to evolve. Okay. Uh, wrote Ignis A.G. Snellen. We'll, we'll read that paragraph in its context in a little bit. Um, well, National Geographic got in on it too. And again, you can find this. Seven alien Earths found orbiting nearby star. The Earth-sized worlds orbit a star just 39 light years away. And most may have the right conditions to host liquid water on their surfaces. Well, somewhere on their surfaces anyway. Seven rocky planets orbiting a nearby star may be roughly the size of Earth and could even be right for water and maybe life to adorn their surfaces. Researchers announced Wednesday. The planets which circle a star called TRAPPIST-1, just 39 light years away, are tucked together so tightly that they routinely spangle each other's skies, sometimes appearing as shimmering crescents and at other times as orbs nearly twice the lar as large as a full moon. And they have that one of those photos that you've seen. And, um, and now it's among the best neighborhoods to study for science of life beyond the Earth. That is, the, uh, the relative sizes of planets and star plus the system's proximity mean that plucking the signatures of living, breathing organisms from the planet's atmospheres could be within reach. Maybe we'll find out that they have life. That would be really wonderful. Moving on down a little further. And now we get to the first hint that there might be problems. But don't get too excited about life yet for a number of reasons. First of all, the system is comparable in scale and architecture to Jupiter and its four large moons, each of which orbits the giant planet with the same face pointed inward all the time. Very much like our moon. TRAPPIST-1's planets likely do the same, meaning that one of their hemispheres is kept relatively toasty while the other is perpetually facing into the cold cosmic night. And if you're going, well, how does the Earth spin and Jupiter spin and these things are tidally locked? Well, probably the best answer for that is that the Earth is far enough away from the Sun so the tidal forces haven't stopped its rotation yet. Whereas the, uh, these planets are close enough to their, the object they're orbiting, a star in this case, that they behave much like the, the uh, moons virtually everywhere else that are tidally locked. That doesn't mean life couldn't evolve in such a world, especially if there's an atmosphere, but it does present some challenges, says study co-author Michael Guion of the University of Leeds. Now, wait a minute. It doesn't mean that life couldn't evolve on such a world. So what, he said, what he's doing is he's kind of downplaying it, but he doesn't want to dampen too many people's enthusiasm. Why not? Well, if one were cynical, one would say that he wants some more grants out of this. Um, if one were a little less cynical, one could say he needs to keep up hope because we need other planets that have life on them so that we can show that life is not unique to the Earth and life could have evolved by random processes because it evolves everywhere else by random processes. Also, the planets are so close to their star and one another that as they jostle their way through an orbit, gravitational forces flex and heat their interiors much as Jupiter does to its large moons, which, remember, are locked to Jupiter, but just because they get closer and further away, uh, they, the tidal stresses on them become greater and less, 
And that small amount of movement will keep Io hot, volcanic inside, and will keep a subsurface liquid water uh, on Europa. This process calls tidal heating is why Europa's interior contains a global sloshing sea and why Io is the most volcanic place in the solar system. So although warm, some of the planets might more closely re resemble Io, Jupiter's moon that completely resurfaces itself with its own volcanic innards every 2,000 years than the balmy beach that I associate with the word habitable, Weiss says. And most importantly, a planet's surface temperature depends greatly on the characteristics of the planet itself, especially of its atmosphere. Just take a look at how hot and hellish Venus is, courtesy of its stifling greenhouse gases. So maybe they really are more like Venus, and they don't, and nothing really grows on Venus. Well, where did all this come from? Well, there's two. Uh, one is a summary, uh, two articles in Nature, uh, which I'll go through first, and then we'll go through the actual uh, numbers behind everything. Uh, the first one is available online if you want to. The second one you have to have special dispensation to get, which fortunately, those of you who are uh, fa uh, faculty or students at Loma Linda do have that. Um, seven small planets whose surfaces could harbor liquid water have been, sp been spotted around a nearby dwarf star. If such a configuration is common in planetary systems, our galaxy could be teeming with Earth-like planets. And then the letter is in reference to the main article. Uh, moving on down, the planetary system is strikingly, strikingly reminiscent of that of Jupiter with its Galilean moons, albeit scaled up in, by mass, in mass by a factor of about 80. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto orbit Jupiter with periods between 1.7 and 17 days, also in near resonance. The, this resemblance suggests that the Trappist one planets and the Galilean moons formed and evolved in a similar way. I don't know, maybe they were created in a similar way, but we won't go there. Uh, this gives you a little better idea of the Trappist one is really not that much bigger than Jupiter. But apparently it's quite a bit heavier. Uh, and it's, uh, it's dense enough and hot enough that it, it sustain some thermonuclear reactions, but much, much less than what we have in our sun. And you can see the sun is considerably larger in terms of size. And these planets are to scale, although, of course, where they are is not to scale. In the past few years, evidence has been mounting that Earth-sized planets are abundant in the galaxy, but Guillaume and uh, Guillon and collaborators' findings indicate that these planets are even more common than previously thought. From geometric arguments, we expect that for every transiting planet found, there should be a multitude of similar planets, 20 to 100 times more, that seen from Earth never pass in front of their host star. That is to say, you have a star, you have planets circling it. If they're circling it this way, you'll never see them. If they're circling it that way, you'll see them, you won't. And vice versa. Um, so they figure that some 20 to 100 times as many planets are there as what we can see. This one, we happen to be lucky and it's, we're seeing it on edge. Um, so they, they never pass in front of their host stars. Of course, the authors could have been lucky, but finding seven transiting Earth-sized planets in such a small sample suggests that the solar system with its four sub-Earth-sized planets might be nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, we also know from Jupiter's moons that a crucial factor for predicting the climate of a planetary body is the heating of its interior owing to friction caused by tides. This effect is responsible for widespread volcanism on Io and is the reason why Europa is thought to have a subsurface ocean. Tidal heating is expected for the Trappist-1 planets because they exist in near-resonant orbits. Could any of the planets harbor life? We simply do not know. But, oh, that's a nice, frankly uh, admitted thing. 
But one thing is certain, in a few billion years when the sun has run out of fuel and the solar system has ceased to exist, TRAPPIST-1 will still be only an infant star. It burns hydrogen so slowly that it will live for another 10 trillion years, more than 700 times longer than the universe has existed so far, which is arguably enough time for life to evolve. I have to say, I kind of smiled at that one. They have no idea. Uh, some of them, I think, may not want to have an idea. Well, let's get to the actual article itself. I'm not going to read the whole thing, obviously. Um, uh, you can get it at nature.com. You can get it from Loma Linda if you know how. But you have to put your password and, uh, and stuff in. One aim of modern astronomy is to detect temperate Earth-like exoplanets that are well-suited for atmospheric characterization. Recently, three Earth-sized planets were detected the transit, that is, pass in front of a star, with a mass just 8% that of the Sun, located 12 parsecs away, and uh, an area probably less than that. The transiting configuration of these planets, combined with the Jupiter-like size, size of their host star, named TRAPPIST-1, makes possible in-depth studies of their atmospheric properties with present-day and future astronomical facilities. Here we report the results of a photometric monitoring campaign of that star from the ground in space. Our observations reveal that at least seven planets with sizes and masses similar to those of Earth revolve around TRAPPIST-1. The six inner planets form a near-resonant chain such that their orbital period, and they give them how many days? are near ratios of small integers. This architecture suggests that the planets formed farther from the star and migrated inward, which is a good thing because early on the star was more active than it is now. Moreover, the seven planets have equilibrium temperatures low enough to make possible the presence of liquid water on their surfaces. And there is the real picture. Along here, and suddenly the uh, luminosity of the star drops by about 1%. Drops maybe 2% here with two planets in front of it. And you can see they've, they've tracked it out as to which planets would cause which drops. Um, the, mo the innermost planet is the one that's going the, the fastest, of course, and then the second innermost planet, and then the third, and then the fourth, and then the fifth, and the sixth. And there is one transit from the seventh. And that's why they don't know very much about it, because they don't really have a complete period as to how it's done. But if you take these data and you expand them, you will get something that looks like this. And now you can see that at a, at a transit, the amount that's going suddenly drops down. And it drops down for a little wider and the one that has period two, and a little wider and the one that has period three. And of course, how far it drops down tells you how big it is, how much of that sun's rays it's blocking. And uh, so there's D, which looks a little smaller. E looks, eh, F, G looks pretty big. And then this H is, we only have one transit, so we're not able to match the transits very well. And we can't match the period, so we don't know how, how often it's going. Um, and from all that, we get this picture. Now, if you're wondering, doesn't that kind of, uh, and isn't that a little bit of extrapolation? Well, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, moving on, uh, the stellar irradiation of the planets covers a range from about 4.3 uh, of the amount that's getting to Earth to about 0.13 as Earth, whereas Earth is a solar irradiation at one astronomical unit, that is, our solar radiation. 
This is very similar to the range seen in the inner solar system. Mercury has 6.7 compared to 4.35, or 4.3, and Ceres has 1.3, which very well matches that number seven. Um, notably, planets C, D, and F have stellar irradiations very close to those of Venus, Earth, and Mars, respectively. However, even at these low insulations, all seven planets are expected to be either tidally synchronized or trapped in a higher order spin orbit resonance. And what is a higher order spin or orbit resonance? It's what Venus does to the Earth. Venus also shows the same size side to the Earth. It turns very, very slowly, and because it's tidally locked on the Earth, um, uh, it doesn't completely lose, it isn't locked like Mercury is to the Sun. Okay. Mercury is actually not quite locked to the Sun either. It, it turns every, um, I think it's uh, two-thirds of a revolution per, uh, per uh, orbit. Um, so there are times when you can get slightly higher order locking rather than just flat out locking like the moon is. Um, but the, the latter, that is higher order spin orbit resonance, is un rather unlikely considering these constraints on the orbital eccentricities. Using a one-dimensional cloud-free climate model that accounts for the low temperature spectrum of the host star, we deduce that planets E, F, and G could harbor water oceans on their surfaces, assuming Earth-like atmospheres. That is part of their surfaces. Other parts would be either too hot or too cold. We found the long-term dynamical evolution of the system to be highly dependent on the exact orbital parameters and masses of the seven planets, which are at present too uncertain to make possible any reliable predictions. So those pictures that looked all wonderful, they're made up out of whole cloth. They, they don't really know even close to what you should be expecting. All of our dynamical simulations predict small but non-zero orbital eccentricities for the six inner planets. The resulting tidal heating could be strong enough to substantially affect their energy budgets and geological activities. So uh, they may be hot inside just from tidal heating, which is not a major problem on Earth. Now, of course, there are critics. And one of them is, um, um, I believe it's David Klinghoffer, uh, who wrote in Evolution News a couple of uh, papers that are of interest. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, by seven alien Earths, they mean planets that are Earth-sized, admitting that the exoplanets have problems Earth doesn't have. For one, because of the orbits are small, they're likely tidally locked, meaning one half of the planet faces a star perpetually irradiating it, while the other is an unending dark. No one knows if any of the seven has an atmosphere, or if so, what kind. NASA offers an artist res rendering of the worlds that makes a couple look uh, pleasant and inviting, just like Earth. Care to take a refreshing dip in the ocean? We'll have a fresh-caught seafood dinner afterward. But obviously, that is total speculation. NASA itself conceded earlier this month that red dwarf stars have their own issues. Quoting, the search for life beyond Earth stars in habitable zones, the regions around the stars where conditions could potentially allow liquid water, was as essential for life as we know it to pool on a planet's surface. New NASA research suggests some of these zones might not actually be able to support life due to frequent stellar eruptions, which spew huge amounts of, st of stellar material and radiation out into space from young red dwarf stars. Well, our star does too, but we're far enough away from it that it almost never hits us. Whereas these things are a lot closer in and a lot bigger targets for, uh, for uh, the uh, stellar, interrupt uh, stellar eruptions. Ooh, I thought that they were nice little cool stars that didn't do anything. Apparently not. So we simply do not know whether any of these planets could or does host an alien biology. Life could have, in fact, evolved. But there's always time to do so in the future, or anyway, arguably so. Remember that comment, 700 times longer than the universe has existed so far. Could be, might be. However, everything else we do know indicates that life can't and won't originate and evolve 
without intelligent design. And that raises an interesting question. Should we find life on one of these planets? Would it be proof of evolution? Or would it be actually proof of intelligent design? Alien evolution remains about the most speculative science subject possible. That is, except for the multiverse, which serves the same purpose. Materialist science must have alien life to show that life, earthly life isn't special. The Copernicus effect must be absolute, and it must have a way to explain away the appearance of cosmic fine-tuning. And so, those two theories. None of this puts a damper on breathless coverage from the popular science media, but the actual science of evolution itself is speculative and unfalsifiable. There's hardly any possibility of testing a theory as feeble as this, Karl Popper wrote, a view he never recanted, as Tom Bethel reports in his new book, Darwin's House of Cards. So to be fair, why hold media coverage to a standard higher than the science itself meets? But, oh, that, that cuts. Anyway, um, moving on to the second article, and he cites these, some of these uh, science reports. Well, not so fast. Most, much of the breathlessness about the system stemmed from a thoroughly imaginative artist rendering courtesy of NASA. Your, your pictures. The planets are design, designated by letters B through H. The middle three planets are def depicted as rather inviting with what appear to be pleasing Earth-like oceans. Today, the Trappist-1 bubble looks to have popped with 3D computer climate modeling showing major problems with the system. According to Eric Wolf of the University of Colorado's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Face Space Physics, the inner three planets would be barren, the outer three frozen, and the middle, planet E, in NASA's rendering, it looks the most Earth-like. However, in a system like this, centering on a dim red dwarf, planet E would need to be stocked to start with seven times the volume of Earth's oceans. Wow. Otherwise, it runs dry. Um, Cosmos magazine cited Dr. Wolf's paper at Archive. Model results indicate that the inner three planets presently reside interior to the inner edge of the traditional liquid water habitable zone. And remember, that's defined as going up to 100, which isn't really habitable. He writes in a paper. Thus, if water ever existed on the inner planets, they would have undergone a runaway greenhouse and lost their water to space, leaving them to dry today. We're leaving them dry today. The outer three planets, he adds, fall beyond the maximum CO2 greenhouse outer edge of the habitable zone and will have entered a lifeless snowball state. Thus, only the middle planet remains a candidate for hosting life. It could maintain at least some habitable surface of notes, depending on the atmospheric nitrogen levels, if the pla planet is, in fact, covered in ocean, the near present day Earth's surface temperatures can be maintained. Although, without rotation, it raises some interesting question about boiling away on one side and freezing on the other. Uh, pardon me, just a minute. Uh, I want to catch this. Go ahead. Unless you have a rotating planet, you can't have a dynamo. Effect. You and can't, you can't protect it from... You can't uh, have a protective against radiation, which will drive away your atmosphere and evaporate your water. That's and, exactly right. And everything right. else. So if a planet doesn't spin, there's no dynamo protection from radiation. And you can't... I mean, it will. every life potentially maintaining quality of the planet will be uh, stripped away. Well, that, that's one problem that, that really hasn't been addressed well, ha has it? Um, However, even one habitable planet may, be, may turn out to be a forlorn hope. Ultra-cold dwarf stars, Wolf says, may take as long as one billion years to settle into a stable system, during which orbiting planets are exposed to intense solar radiation producing extreme greenhouse conditions. If this was the case with TRAPPIST-1, then for the middle planet to retain abundant water today, it would have to have originally held seven times the ocean volume of Earth. Materialists must have alien life to assure themselves that Earth's biology is nothing special, easily replicable by unguided evolutionary processes in many other places in the cosmos. It seems unlikely that the planets around TRAPPIST-1 support life, which means they can't, cannot support evolutionary speculation either. 
Well, actually, being able to, uh, not being able to support life does not uh, stop somebody from evolutionary speculation. But we'll, <laughs> we'll let that one pass. Now it's time to sit back and wait for the, the next half-baked Earth-like exoplanet to be wheeled out on stage by the popular science media. Don't worry, it won't be long. And with that comment, I would have to agree. Now, my take on all this, the TRAPPIST-1 system is, I think, quite fascinating, interesting. It appears that there are several planets that are roughly Earth-sized, orbiting a red dwarf star, apparently a little bigger than Jupiter in diameter. The excitement generated in the press was all out of proportion to the actual scientific data, however, and appear to be dependent on the possibility of finding life on one of more of the planets, which, uh, with a closer inspection, seems unlikely. The poss that possibility is remote without some kind of intelligent design to help it along. The hype includes treating artists' conceptions as data, and claiming that the stars are in a habitable zone while forgetting the tidal locking, solar flares, changes in solar activity with time, and various other factors make f planets around red dwarfs unlikely to harbor life. Don't believe everything you read, especially if an agenda is driving the approach to research. Uh, standard news media are particularly bad at this, they get to report the exciting parts and leave out the caveats. And in general, the research itself is less likely to mislead, although even there you, uh, you may have uh, a little over-enthusiastic uh, expectations from the research itself. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Telescope actually vis have a visual on these, or because no. I know they can detect these, they supposedly can detect these through some indirect means. Yeah, all they, they all they really is have telescope. is a decrease of light from the planet at, at various intervals, which are at least oh. in some cases periodic. Okay. That's what they really have. Ev yeah. Yeah. Everything else, you, this is so small relative to its distance and it's far away. that you cannot resolve the disk itself. You cannot see a little black dot going across it. All you can see is light from a, what is essentially a point from our perspective, mm. uh, dimming slightly. And that's what the telescopes pick up? And that's up. what the telescopes actually see. And the rest of those pictures, no. <laughs> They are not pictures. Pipe, pipe dreams. <laughs> oh, I can't. It's, I'm tempted to say, is this the age of Aquarius coming to fruition? <laughs> well, if it helps any, Trappist One is in Aquarius. Well, that's why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Uh, from a slightly broader perspective, I think these four, each one of them needs to take a course in biochemistry. Uh, I think they wouldn't make these statements, you know. That, Just uh, another 700 I million mean, years, that should do it, don't you think? Th there's a difference between having water and originating life. Uh, that needs to be uh, kept in perspective. But, uh, looking at it from a broader perspective yet, uh, uh, the Bible suggests there's life beyond Earth. And Ellen White certainly supports that idea. Uh, somewhere out there, there has to be some, possibly some habitable planets. Uh, there might although, be. Although I don't think these qualify here. You know, you know, what the argument sounds like is this. We go to Mars and we find arrowheads. As a matter of fact, we find computers that have kind of broken down in the sunlight. <laughs> then we go to, uh, I don't know, Titan, and we find more arrowheads and more computers that have broken down. And we say, aha, you see, arrowheads and computers can arise out of natural processes. <laughs> you, you don't like that. <laughs> what if the computers had 
chips that said uh, Intel. <laughs> <laughs> well, c couldn't they, uh, somebody suggest uh, uh, a meteorite hit the Earth and flew off to Mars with uh, a computer having been in the way? Uh huh. I mean, this is not all that different from the way they think that uh, these meteorites from Mars uh, had evidence of life. Well, a Mars-sized object hit the Earth and created our moon now, so that must be the answer for uh, what happened. And a little piece of it flipped off to Mars, and, and the arrowheads went with it. Um, uh, of but course, all the there, there's some small problems of chronology here, but... Uh, <laughs> but all the building blocks for computers and arrowheads are already ready available. I, I don't see the issue. Computer evolution here. <laughs> I mean, 10 trillion years, that's plenty enough time for a few arrowheads and computers. So, uh, yeah, the, the thing is, is that um, let's say you had a perfect planet that, that rotated, perfect place, water on the surface that you could actually see. Uh, so basically a twin to Earth. With continents and the whole bit, right? And uh, you sterilize that planet and you let it float around for, you know, 10 trillion years or whatever this, this lifespan of the star is going to be. And uh, statistically, that's still a drop in the bucket for giving the most simple life form possible to actually self-generate itself. It's just uh, people reporting on this, and, and actually, unfortunately, most biologists, they don't understand the statistical odds of what they're talking about um, when it comes to informational complexity. These things just don't happen by themselves, even if you have ideal conditions set up ahead of time which you can set up in the lab and observe it and set up on supercomputer even uh, the actual true model of the system and, and simulate trillions of years and it, it still will never happen. And uh, that's, that's the real issue here. You know, uh, it's interesting because uh, Doug Axe introduced a term which I had not thought of before, but which is a very, very useful term. Um, he says it's physically impossible. And what he means by that is if you turned every single particle in the universe into a chance flipping machine, you would not expect to find the particular formation that you're looking for um, at odds that are less than, than the odds of finding a, a, a one of those computers. Um, that, let me put it this way, you know, there's an interesting question uh, that was raised. Uh, some of you may remember a while back that I had uh, 560 coins on a, uh, on a background. And, you know, one of them looked random, another one looked random, and a third one read due to chance. And everybody picks that one out as being not random. <laughs> um, now, if you think about this, it is theoretically possible, and in fact, probably mathematically near certain, that if you go out on the digits of pi far enough, you will eventually find both that random sequence and that non-random sequence. But the question that I will give you is this. Could you really do that? And the reason I ask it that way is because, think about it this way. In order to do that, what you'd have to do is you'd have to run a string of digits, a pi. You would have to task a computer to do that, right? And then you'd put them into ones and zeros, or actually you probably compute them in ones and zeros, and then periodically you would pull out a frame and you'd look at it. Maybe you'd look at every single frame as we went by. You would run out of computer time before you would find either the random uh, one that we did by flipping coins, or the one that says due to chance. You physically could not do it. It is a ridiculous way of trying to get there. 
because there just isn't enough time to go through enough combinations to get to the place where you need to go. And you might as well believe in divinity at that point anyway. Because using your same argument, you could get people raised from the dead. You could get uh, any kind of miracle in the Bible that you want. You could get, uh, you know, fire coming down from heaven and burning up uh, an altar <laughs> at, at your command. All that stuff would happen, and all of a sudden it looks very divine, or at least very supernatural. And, and at that point, it really isn't a scientific argument anymore. It, you undermine science itself. Things, things are really not predictable anymore, because if you say that in a multi-universe anything can happen, well, you might as well believe in God. Because there's no, is there, there really is no science at that point. You know, and you're, you're absolutely right. You can say and, and anything that you can possibly imagine could happen. You can happen, make intelligent happen. guesses to, from, from in, in front, but from behind you have absolutely no defense against, but I saw the guy walking on water. Well, he's in the right multi-universe. You know? So at some points it becomes ridiculous. The, the molecules just erase themselves under his feet. Um... um you see, the, the whole question about the origin of life runs up against another problem. Before you can have life that could sus be sustainable, you have to have the entire multiplicity of repair mechanisms in place to maintain the integrity of the genetic sequence that was somehow obtained. Regardless how. That's right. Not only do you have to find it, but now you have to preserve it. So you that have you can... to protect it. If you do not protect it, the whole thing will fall apart in no time at all. Yeah. And, and how do we know that? Because the organisms which are mutated to fail at some of these repair mechanisms die out in a hurry. You know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah. it's, it's a strange phenomenon. Yeah. You not only have to have life, but you have to have the entire machinery in place to maintain it. The most modest bacterium has around 200 repair mechanisms operating just to maintain the integrity of its genome. And higher organisms have much more elaborate systems in place. Yeah. Yeah. How can we then talk about chance putting it all together? No, you can't do that. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, it really is. When you think about it, um, these are people chasing what looks to them like final proof that we are not special that we are, um, that we're just a product of uh, cosmic forces that are beyond our um, uh, beyond our power to create, but somehow stupider than us. The, the only ones who would be willing to communicate. Beyond maintain, you have to have the ability to reproduce. You'll never start life. Uh, well, you know, I mean, there's a whole Eugene Coonan thing where he says, give it up. We're going to have to have multiple universes in order to get there. You just can't do it on your own. And it's the first mm -hmm. time anybody said that in print because, because now you can cite mm -hmm. that article it's it's just like the Durrett and Schmidt article where they tried to argue against Behe and said, well, he was wrong. He said it was one in whatever it was, 600 billion years, and it's actually only one in every 200 million years to get uh, two mutations to get to a new protein. And, you know, when you think about it, we're supposed to be only mm -hmm. like six million years diverged from monkeys. That means that we shouldn't have any, but, or maybe one. And there's obviously way more than one Mu uh, uh, mu double mutation different from us, between us and monkeys. Uh, a diversionary corollary to the multiverse uh, argument that Sean was mentioning here is that uh, the Bible is very scientific. 
using the same argument that, you know, anything could happen if you have enough universes. This, you could say, okay, well, if that's the way you're going to find science, the Bible is scientific, because no matter what happens, there it is. Well, and, and the interesting thing of it is there are observations that fit into the scientific frame that are just incredible, like the guy who was born blind, uh, not so much that he got healed, but that he had researched the possibility of cure beforehand. And you may remember he says it's never happened in the history of the world. Well, that's a rather striking scientific statement, and it turns out to be that there's a good reason for that. So uh, it, it is basically that if you don't, if you, there's a critical period where the neurons are developing and if you don't allow light to come into the eyes so that it creates a movement in the circuitry of the eyes and then goes back into the brain, that afterwards you can shine all the light you want to and it doesn't matter because the circuits aren't developed and it doesn't recognize anything. And, and, and he was able to say it's never happened that way. And, you know, people, people do this a lot. They say, well, those people weren't scientific. No, they were scientific. Joseph was getting ready to divorce his espoused wife because he knew where babies came from. It wasn't a cabbage patch. It wasn't a cabbage patch, and it wasn't a stork. I mean, think about that. They were perfectly as scientific as we are. They just believed that there was a higher power that could meddle. And the scientists among us who subscribe to th what they call f uh, methodological naturalism and what is really philosophical naturalism in disguise basically are saying, you can't do that. Um, and not only you can't do that, but God can't do that. That's what it boils down to. It's interesting that they were able to restore sight to an individual who was about five or six years of age, and he had no visual memory recall, and you could show him an apple and a picture of apple, and he could not identify which was the real and which was the, the uh, photo because of those circuits not able to function. And the good Lord not only healed the gentleman's eyes, but he also healed the circuitry so that the eye could function as exactly. a real eye. When Jesus healed the man born blind, putting stuff on his eyes was not good enough. It was not good enough. And the interesting thing of it is that you even have a hint of this in another blind healing miracle where somebody is healed and he says, they look like trees, they look like men. I'm not sure which one is which, you know. Uh, the only way I can tell that they're men instead of trees is because one's walking. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, we need another round of it. And what that tells you is that Je th this is not magical clay that Jesus is using. This is creative power of a kind that you and I don't have access to except by the good grace of God. And that's why the man could say, the man called Jesus did this, but you know what? He's a prophet, and you know what? You're arguing about whether he's a prophet because he did it on Sabbath. Well, listen. If this man were not of God, he could not have done anything. And he was precisely right, and the Pharisees knew it. Well, that was, I think uh, we're ready to close close to on time. <laughs> so are these planets spinning? No, well, they they're, are spinning at exactly the same rate as they're going so around they're the sun. Locked they're locked the tidally. Oh. So, if, I mean, if you were talking about spinning and you were looking out from above, you would see the planet turn, but you would also see it so turning around the sun. The day is the same size as the year. Exactly. Oh, Very much like the moon day is the same size as the moon year for going around the Earth. 
Anyway, next week we'll talk about carbon-14 and an interesting new report uh, and revisit some old reports. Um, and um, there's a proposal, and we, we hope someday to be able to have Er Taylor talk about his new proposal for an experiment. And we'll see what happens with that. Anyway, see you next week.